from the 305 to the 303, this is TCSP. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Brian and the Cadbury Serious Band. You one of the best and you've got the best. The hottest podcast in the land, TCSP. That's probably too much, I think. I don't know. We'll, we'll edit that later. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Casually Serious Podcast. How y'all doing today? Bobby Mack in the house, dude. It's so good to see you, man. You're everywhere. You're always following us, man. I appreciate that so much. We have got an awesome special edition today of the Casually Serious podcast mixtape today. Um, you know, I've got a friend that we're that we're going to bring in right now. And, you know, we've been friends for a long, long time. He was the first dude that I met in Austin, Texas. And there were a couple things that we bonded on right away. One of them was the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, and the other one was Kiss. And when I thought I was fanatic about both of those two things, I met this dude. And, uh, you know, he let me know that there were other people in the world, especially people from Texas, that were fanatics about those two particular things, too. But today we have got the Record Stash Revisit. And what we're going to do with this show, uh, and I, we don't know right away whether it's going to stay on Thursdays at this time. It might hop around until we find a proper home for this lost animal. But uh, regardless, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into sections of careers of artists, uh, maybe go from the beginning, maybe take some of their, uh, the, the, maybe some better era times and, and focus on that. But with KISS, we're basically going to start all the way from the beginning and I would imagine stop sometime around the time they took their makeup off. Now, I guess you can call myself a purist for feeling that way. And uh, I guess you're right. I don't necessarily love Van Halen without David Lee Roth. Uh, there are plenty of times and instances in music where when a band evolves and changes members, I sort of not jump ship, just uh, go to another ship and swim to one. I don't know. Whatever the case is, uh, I, all I know is that I don't necessarily... Uh, love the changes that can happen sometimes with bands. So anyway, having all said that, uh, what we're going to focus on is Kiss. And like I said, today is going to be the first three studio albums all the way up to the the uh, first live record they did, which pretty much changed the fucking world. Uh, but before we get all into that, guys, I want to bring in a good friend of mine. One of my best friends uh, plays in uh, and by fist uh, uh, Shadow Keep. He was the bassist and creator of uh, uh, Drifter. Uh, Iron Maiden tribute band. I was lucky enough to manage and book out in Austin, Texas for a long time. You met him when he was here with Jason McMaster uh, doing the Iron Maiden versus Judas Priest Legends battle. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for my brother, Stoney Grantham. Yes. Bob, how are you doing? You appear. How you doing, man? And everyone out in the ether. I'm doing well, man. Thank you so much for asking, dude. I'm good, man. I was I've been looking forward to this for a long time since we talked about it, man. We uh you know, I I don't really know what the the uh yes. Nice, good stuff, man. I love it. I was I was actually doing some searching and trying to find some things uh, around the house that were kiss related. And I, I was actually in, in quite a shortage of stuff in terms of like coffee mugs and the usual kitschy stuff. Yeah. My friends always send me the most amazing kiss things I, my friend Jay sent me just sends me shit from all over the world. Uh, so, I, I, yeah, I have like a lot of weird kiss stuff. But, uh, yeah, I don't have a badass pint glass. So shout, shout out to Stoney for the pint glass, man. Hey, you got a, who, that's, that show was the uh, destroyer pint glass but this is a love gun pint glass <laughs> this time so we vowed to go to uh, the very beginning of all this uh kiss stuff and and talk about uh the first few recordings dive into some of that stuff obviously talk about some of the tracks and things like that but you know before we get into that what is it what is it that got you into kiss man i mean we we know how important it is in our life and has been since we were a little shits uh what is it that turned you into a fanatic it goes way back. Um, I think I was in fourth grade and uh, maybe fifth, but it was fourth or fifth grade. But uh, 
this would have been 75 or 76 and uh kind of sounds stupid now but this kid uh shows me a you know instead of showing me a girly picture he, he's like hey check this out on the playground you know and he pulls this little white photo like three by three picture black and white picture of these four dudes in makeup and you like it's a band, blah blah, blah you know. And I was just like, <laughs> "It's a band." You had to explain to you what that yeah. was. <laughs> I wasn't into bands or music at all. I was a Dallas Cowboy fan, and you know, whatnot, a GI Joe or whatever. But <clears throat> it kind of left an impression on me. And within a a year, I was uh, really starting to pay attention. And uh, you know, it was obviously it was the makeup and uh, you know, as people get the the gimmick, but. Uh, First one I bought was uh, with my own lawn mowing, mowing money was Kiss Alive 2. And it it changed everything, basically, forever. You know? It's changed everything. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly that kind of moment. I know exactly what you're talking about, man. Like, fucking world shift. And you were saying it wasn't even a Playboy, but I'll tell you what, it was. It would be burning your head just as, 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 as much as the first naked picture you saw or whatever the case was. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's... It's insane, dude. I, I I get it, man. I was lucky enough to um I guess my brother uh my brother Bill was really really hardcore into them, so I was able to uh, kind of have that influence from him. He passed along all that. But I you know by the time let's see um, I was born in seventy three, so so was Kiss. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it, it took a while. I was like eight, nine years old when I had to go back. And I, and like you said, the very first record of, of theirs, I even laid my eyes on and, and was like, what is this about was Alive 2? Because back then, for all you youngins, you would open up a gatefold uh, of two of a double album and it would be a gigantic picture or, or something very worthwhile in the middle of it. And and most of the time in Kiss's case, toys and all kinds of really kick-ass shit. Right. Uh, but that, but that, that major... Uh, explosion going on, if you will, in the background. This, if you will, right there behind me. I was just about to refer to that. Um, that sucked me in, man. In 77, I was uh, 10, and uh, I was at a store with kind of like a Kmart or a Woolworths um, at the time called TGY. And, uh, you know, my mom's getting groceries or whatever. So I wander off to everybody had a record, you know, record of. Uh, what he could display back then. So um, I'm looking at the albums, you know, walking along. And on the end of the aisle, <laughs> there's crates, like, just piled up, you know, <laughs> one of, like, they just bought them, dollied them off a truck, and they're all, it was all Kiss Alive too, dude. And wow. I, I knew about them already, so I, I looked at the cover, Gene, especially on the back, same as the front, and I was like, I have to have this. So I walked around the rest of the hour with my mom, by my mom, you know, with her buggy and kind of trying to, you know, put it in the <laughs> basket and she keeps taking it out. And <laughs> I keep putting it back, you know, I won the little fight, I guess. And uh, that was it, man. The gate wow. Pole, the gate pole alone without listening to it uh, blew my mind, you know? Yeah. That was definitely the catch, man. And I, I remember saying to myself, cool, this guitarist has orange hair, man. I've never seen that before. Um, <laughs> and, and I remember when when I would when I went back to start looking at some of the old, maybe older pictures, I was like, wait a minute, why doesn't he have orange hair anymore? And I don't, I don't know how long it went before I realized that was the fucking lighting. But really, it was just it, the whole thing was like Gene's blood just, yeah. you know, like it was I was already a horror fan already. You That's know what I mean? And so like. That's the kind of thing that triggered in me. I just saw this Fangoria, uh, like magazine cover, and was like, "Holy shit! This is this is like horror music." I have to hear it. <laughs> Not to mention, uh, Gene on that picture is the sweatiest human being in existence. Yeah, so there was yeah. that freakish thing even outside the blood and makeup. So yeah, same here, man. Uh, we're talking about Kiss Alive too, but we're not really supposed to be talking about Kiss Alive. Hey, you know what, man? I I'm, I, I asked the question, so be it. If it was it, well, if it was Crazy Nights for some reason, whatever, man. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> that, is the, that, I, that was the gateway for sure, dude. Uh, and then I just kind of wandered around and kissed mm -hmm. them uh, after that for years. You know, 
well, I know we had all of the records at that point, but for some reason, I don't know what it was, but Alive 2 was the one I pulled out that one time. Uh, I had definitely already pulled out some, uh, maybe some cheap trick and, you know, a lot of stuff that my brother, my, my older brother would uh, have bossed in and uh, some of that other stuff. So I was just flicking through like amazing fucking music when I think about it and landed on Kiss and was like, I got to hear this now because, and then that's when I started remembering uh, the memories of like Cream Magazine and Hit Parader start coming back where, you know, like we, I started almost trying to collect their image in some way and don't have any of it now. I got to say something about your story there, Bob, is uh, you're really lucky to uh, have a brother with all those records already because like, I had a one, one older sister and she had like a bunch of 45 singles. Right. Sean Cassidy. Yeah. Yeah. Elton John and you yeah. know, things. And I went, so my, my sister too. I had no uh, uncles, no brothers that were into heavy music, really, you know. So uh, my, the wheels were turning really slow <laughs> in, in my youth. You know, it would come from friends at their houses, their older brothers. Um, she did filter me a few things down, like Ted Nugent, Blois to Cult, Triumph, uh, Van Halen, the first Van Halen album. <laughs> but other than that. Huge. Those are huge bands, too. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff to, to borrow from her, but um, oh, by and large, I had to. It was like uh, rock and roll archaeology, for, you know, for me. I had to yeah. dig everything I, I eventually fell in love with. You know, and I'll tell you what: if if that in fact was archaeology, then you know, I was digging and finding very old bones in their debut album because I remember going back and looking at that, going, "Oh, like what the fuck is wrong with this Peter guy's face in this one?" and and um, like how old this must have been 50 years ago, you know, like in kid ages, that was just like a lifetime ago. Uh, yeah. Five albums can be the span of your entire lifetime, apparently, is what I thought. Uh, when in fact, it's about four years in kiss time. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm going to give some shout outs real quick to the folks that came. Bobby back always saying, what's up, Bobby? Thanks for joining today. I've got someone named Mozavala. Do you know who Mozavala is by any chance? Not Tell yet. Me. But uh, I I, yeah, but welcome. I was just curious because I think I had seen him uh, like some of the things that you reposted or something like that from TCSP. So regardless, well, thanks for coming and hanging out. And Jay Mackin, as always, man, what's going on? Jay saying that we were all Gene Simmons for Halloween, you know, at, at least 10 times in my life for sure. Uh, I've got pictures all up and down my wall at my house in Miami of me and Gene make up for uh, holding a Fender Stratocaster six string, too, by the way. <laughs> uh, for some reason, it didn't matter as long as it was sunburst or something. Uh, it was better than a couch cushion, you know, or, or a tennis racket, right? And I don't know if you remember this. Uh, oh, yes, at fairs getting face paint too, Jay. Good point. Uh, the last time I wore Gene Simmons makeup, Letty put it on for me. What? Really? Yeah, man. This was um, 2003, I want to say. Maybe 2003, 2004. I went to, to uh, 6th Street as Gene Simmons in a priest outfit. Whoa, I remember that. I think I Yeah, remember. there you go. Yeah. And you, 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 you dropped by the house. So, uh, I, I, yeah, because I certainly, I mean, I probably might have been able to do it, but I certainly, I didn't have faith in myself. But my, yeah, better, so that's, half, my better half could paint you up on jeans. Did it, did, it, did it good, man. I don't know how long I stayed out in it. And it was a, definitely a very weird thing, but I was a weird dude at that time. So, uh, but at any rate, guys, you know, let's let's get into it right now. Let's let's talk about the first album. Let's uh, let's see the intro. Kiss debut album. So when I went back on this one, uh, I, I remember being young and looking at it and going, "This is, this is weird." But but then I, I started hearing the songs and I was like, "Okay, <coughs> some of these are on that Alive Two album that I really like." Uh, and now I understand that. And now I and I started started getting the concept because of Kiss that you put out a record, and then you play it live in a concert. I don't know if I attached those two theories at age eight or nine or whatever the case might have been at that time. So that, you know, we're talking about when we're kids, we don't really put that together. We know it all now. It's common knowledge, but uh, right. it didn't make sense. I thought a, an album was just something that they cut live, like <laughs> they rehearsed it. And then like, I don't know. I don't know. What all fucking... on the same room, one take, <laughs> and there's your record, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, everybody, everybody thinks that at eight years old or nine years old, you can't. I guess so. I guess so. But I'll tell you what, 
Uh, well, you know what? I'll save that for the for Kiss Alive because that was what I was getting to. But look at this track list. We start off with Strutter, Nothing to Lose, uh, Firehouse, Cold Gin, Let Me Know, Kiss in Time, Deuce. We got the love theme from Kiss. You do. Uh, 100,000 Years, Black Diamond. Uh, you know, with the exception of maybe about three of those songs, um, I love that album. I eventually learned to love that album. And as I got older and I started getting more nostalgic, I, re I realized what it was. Uh, you start thinking of, of like the beginnings of stuff. Uh, but what what did you, what was your opinion of the album the first time you heard it? Well, let me ask you a question first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, go ahead. You said you you started liking it or loving it later. Was it? It was even though you probably didn't realize what it was at the time. Was it the production, uh, the dryness of it, and as compared to like Alive or whatever? Like you know, oh, that's a good question. I, I um. I think maybe there was a, well, I mean, a polish because it was a studio record. Yeah, I think maybe, but I think I could probably have said that for anything that I went back and listened to after a live to anyway. But yeah. there was something about that first album um, that that did sound more of like a raw, like, let's record this one time and see how it sounds. And then they just put it on a record. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. There was a garage bandness to it. Uh, even though I didn't know anything about that at the time, I think you're right. I think that might have been it. There was just this raw sort of in your face and even though it was very rock and roll straightforward rock and roll uh, it definitely had an edge to it for some reason maybe because i was staring at the, the album the whole time i don't true well that's what we did right uh at that time especially yeah. but, um when we're all really young we don't really understand none of us do really i didn't understand production you know what, what what's production first of all no, probably never <laughs> i just would i was wondering why do these songs sound so different and slower than they do on a live I, but i didn't know why but anyway to get to the point um first album like i said i didn't really have it early on when i was young but uh i went back as i got a little older and like a lot of bands man they those guys had time sometime to write the songs that went on that first album so a lot of debut albums are, are strong in that regard, uh, whereas they get kind of rushed and put under pressure in their sophomore and junior releases and stuff like that. Um, so they have a longer time to develop those, you know, as they're playing clubs and, and, and rehearsing a lot, they have a lot more time before debut albums and that shows, even in, in, even in the, the, the Kiss debut, that shows, you know, the there's tons of classics that, they probably played for the, they still do for their entire career live yeah. from that one record it, it is chock full of uh again strutter uh deuce dude hundred thousand years come on black diamond uh it's true just, and i and i and i wonder and, and i guess i would have to go back on that other than maybe alive and alive too <laughs> um like they would have to mix in some of their new material and take the old material on them. So as you, as you set lists evolved, you know, I, I remember, you know what the funny thing is? I think the first time I ever saw kiss in concert, like a full concert on video was animalized, believe it or not. Wow. Like I, I, I hadn't seen any like full concert videos of them up to that point. Well, there um, really weren't any, I mean, it's not, it's not a, that you were missing the boat or anything. I mean, yeah. I don't think there was <laughs> any anyway. Nothing really existed. Uh, I mean, they sure as hell weren't going to let uh, Winterland or something like that uh, bootleg yeah. out of the closet at that time. So, and that's crazy too, man. We, I remember Winterland was one of the most sought after footage. Uh, right at the time I was living in Austin, Texas, actually, I was going over to my friend's house who had LimeWire, and I was like, "Please." I have to get this parasite video clip. And he's like, what the fuck's up with this? What's with the parasites? And I'm like, dude, it's a kiss song, dude. Just fucking download it for me. And it would go three days and then click. It would just, it would disconnect. Oh, really? Right? Somebody was on the other end, like going, hey, and then yeah. right when it was about to download, they would like cut it off. Wow. Um, that's yeah, great. So, but that's like, it was black and white footage of kiss. You know what I mean? And I, and I think maybe when I was younger, I thought the, the, the album, uh, since it was black and white, it was just such an old album that it was like in the black and white era. I think that's sort of how I equated all that because, you know, yeah. I was still young enough to have a black and white TV in my house when that was going down. I was just like, oh, this is weird, man. But uh, may as well have been 1940, right? <laughs> Seriously, yeah. dude. So what is uh, what, what, what is your what do you think your favorite song is on this album? 
Well, it's tough, dude. I know. I put you on the spot like I did making you choose between Iron Maiden and, and Judas Priest, but try. Uh, I got to say, man, um, well, what, what are we picking two here? I'm going to have to go with Deuce and 100,000 Years. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I was maybe going to grab Deuce on that one, eh, but I didn't. Um, I, I, I think 100,000 100, Years and God, maybe Cold Gin. Hmm. I just for just that one line, the cheapest stuff is uh, all I need. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, like the, cause there was in between all the the very straightforward Beatles esque rock and roll that they were playing for us. Uh the only thing that I think that made it edgy for us as the fans was looking at them. Because if we were to just never have seen KISS uh and and maybe just even started focusing on their Wicked Lester stuff. Uh, we would have been like, well, these guys are just some, you know, sort of hip rock and roll band. Kind of uh, just, but, uh, yeah, it wouldn't have been nothing out of the ordinary. It would have been like, hey, I kind of like it or I don't or, you know, it wouldn't have been like, oh, my God, did you see these guys? Because you can't see it while you're listening, you know, like that. Right. So, um, but I mean, I think it was as it was solid rock and roll for the time. Not. Yeah. You know, let's, let's put it this way. I was thinking about uh, why people were. Uh, made fun of or ridiculed in the 70s by older kids for um, not just for liking kiss but if you're if you're 14 or 13 in 1974 mm -hmm. and you, your older brother and his crowd are they're all buying Led Zeppelin albums and uh, uh, Alice Cooper albums and stuff like that uh, Jethro Tull or, or you know stuff like that Black Sabbath okay the last thing you really want to do is be that kid that goes over and gets that one album by that one band that has clown makeup on. <laughs> At the time, let's face it, they only had that one record sitting in the bins, right? Yeah. And we all know from history that it didn't sell well. And I was thinking, why Why didn't it? Because that, that's an attention grabber, right? The, the cover. Yeah. I would think that, you know, when you're 13, you don't want to, the last thing you want is ridiculed. Right. So I was think, putting myself there in, in those kids spot at that, at that time and thinking, you know, who knows? I may have walked over and grabbed Zeppelin four, even though I wanted to buy that first kiss album because of the cover, you know, I don't know if I could have taken the heat in 1974 either, you know, taking who, what came along with it. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. I mean, that I think that was part of the reason it didn't sell because it would definitely have garnered attention on the, on the shelves, you know, just from the cover alone. So well, I'm telling you what, I, I, I'm your generation gets the credit for taking all the shit. So my generation <laughs> could just walk into an accepted band. Whereas you guys were the ones getting fucking, somebody's telling you, Oh, they suck. And then two, three <laughs> years later, they're actually a fan. <laughs> we died for your sins. Right? Yes. <laughs> you, you were definitely the, uh, the, uh, the lamb. For sure, <laughs> but you know what? Hey, let's take a let's take a quick gander at uh at this clip. Let's see how long we can get away with showing this. Dun -dun -dun. That's audio, so maybe we'll be all right. I don't think you'll hear vocals very well. So that was their rehearsals. That's 1973. I was about to ask you. Uh, the, was yeah, that that's the loft. They didn't get Ace Freely till 73. Am I right about that? Yeah, and you know it's funny because that's like sort of a very uh, 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 the the picture that's on that video is them just in whiteface because they had yet to even start coming to character with any of that. Uh, yeah. I do believe that is the year. Yes, which is when you hear it, you actually hear 
uh, Paul screaming because he's not, we, they don't have a PA yet. They don't. Have, so he's just screaming to like the six people in the, in the, in the loft that they're hanging out with. Woo! Yeah. And like, if you listen to the rest of that audio and I don't really know if I'm going to get hit with copyright for any of that. So I don't want to take too more of it, too much more of it. But uh, if you go and listen to that, you'll see it's actually a rehearsal for what they're going to become. It's quite an amazing, uh, uh, recording, if I'm being honest. I think Delaney was actually the one recording that because he would sit in the back and videotape it and record it and then let them know what their choreography was. I think he was the first one that noticed that Paul itched his head a lot. Yeah. Uh, so they, they, were, they, they were very I mean, bad. They were lucky to have Delaney at that time, really, to have him involved, too. Yeah. It made a huge difference, man. That guy was basically their, uh, like their style coordinator. Yeah. And you know their perform I mean? performance coach, all of the above, man. Yeah, I, was he in a he was in a relationship with Alcoin at that time, right? I believe he already was. Yeah, or yeah. he was a little later, but he was uh, he was obviously around. And uh, I think you're right. I think he was involved with Alcoin by that time. Which is kind of crazy too, because I, I don't know if he was openly gay at the time, but it didn't fucking matter. You know what I mean? Like it went through this time where everyone was cool, '60s and '70s, and then '80s, and I guess AIDS had a lot to do with maybe the stigma or whatever. You know, or so that, but. It was yeah. never an issue with them, man. Delaney would be fucking driving them around all over the place, man. I, you know, all the stories we know about him, he was definitely a party monster too, dude. Sure, man. And uh, well, a coin too, I had no idea, you know. Not that it matters, but, uh, you know, look what he did too for Kiss. You yeah. Know, he did a hell of a job uh, in the manager seat. Yeah, he basically put Kiss on his credit cards um, <laughs> and, and floated them throughout the first tours that they did, which was uh, – you know, pretty, that, that must have been pretty tough, man. I mean, yeah. he was going into debt and uh, been paying them back after the tour was massively successful, the sort of the second time around, and which is a pretty amazing little situation, man. Uh, yeah. um, going back to the, the debut album, uh, like I said, those songs Strutter, uh, 100,000 Years, Deuce, um, Nothing to lose, even I love that song. Uh, it's got a really bad uh, <laughs> message. <laughs> well, bad. I don't know what I mean. What do you think is bad? I don't. I think well, really bad. at that at that time, parents already hated them. Churches yeah. already hated them. So why not talk about trying to have sex with someone in their butt? It's not bad in a way of. I mean, it makes me laugh. Uh, it's it's hilarious actually. If they just oh. write a song about that, but what was the uh, other? Um, uh, no, I'm trying to think. There was a cup. There was one I was just listening to. What is it that where Gene Simmons is like? So you like the meat? Um, the selection of meat, or what was it? What song is it? Uh, <laughs> the selections looking fine as I move on down the line. It's like he's at a buffet of women. <laughs> None of that would fly now, right? None of it. Look, None man, it, they're so sexist. And uh, holy shit, dude! I find nothing funnier than that because they were so blatantly over the top with it, dude, and. and they weren't even doing it as a joke. Like we would now, maybe, no. you know, they, they believed what they were talking about. The tongue was not in cheek, uh, uh, literally with that no. band. They, it was, it was in your face. I love it too, man. When I listen to a lot of these early, you know, they just kind of slid it under the radar. And I think, I think maybe they were even able to play a lot of it on radio because they didn't get the innuendo and they weren't saying fuck or shit or anything like that. So we're just like, well, you know, dude, they played nothing to lose on national television in '74. You're right. On the uh, what's that? Uh, that daytime talk show. Uh, that was uh, Mike Douglas, right? Yes, and you had probably uh, at least uh, ten thousand uh, housewives saw that at like one thirty in the afternoon, and uh, that's the song we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> on prime time national television. I guess nobody really paid attention to the lyrics, you know, but it, I find that hilarious, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know what? Let's, I think it's worth shining a light on Stoney. I, I, I want to thank you for that. Let's go ahead and check this out real quick. Before I had a baby, I didn't care anyway. I thought about the back door. I didn't know what to say, but once I got a baby, I tried every way. Every she way. didn't want to do it, but she did anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh. Babe, you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. Uh, yeah, it's, like I said, I do. Re I just find it hilarious, really. You know. Yeah, they didn't care, and I think Role Models was one of the first movies I saw to like shine a light on the fact that uh, 
anytime they used the word love uh, or kiss, it was probably fuck or dick would be the, you know, there's interchangeable uh, love gun, obviously things like that. They were able, I I think that was the first time I saw because they actually had a kiss segment in that movie. That was the first time I heard anybody kind of explain that. Uh, He was like, yeah, man, you're going to love this band kiss. All they talk about is their dicks (laughs) 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 and they played love gun. He's like, it's all a song about his, you know, so basically they went in, but yes, it's, it's really the beauty of the innuendo that they were able to pass by because Gene was such a fucking massive perv dude. True. And it's also a, a cool look at, at the time in which it was happening. Uh, people weren't hypersensitive about anything. You know, it was all rock and roll. It was all good. And let's have a good time. And, uh, you know, don't be so offended by everything. Kiss couldn't even exist in this climate that we're in today. I don't think, you know, I mean, starting the way they were writing songs and uh, lyrics. Well, again, I think we're talking about uh, what Kiss did to change the world. There was a lot of things that they did, but they definitely were the one, one of the bands that were able to slide in you windows and, and still get mass appeal. Uh, and, and, you know, it, 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 the re- it, I think everything kind of happens in sort of succession like this. Like, obviously, we couldn't do now what we did then because we've learned now from what we did then. You know what I'm saying? But there's there's yeah. just, you know, you can't even have a record industry now. <laughs> That's true. And, uh, and, of course, they weren't the only ones doing it. Led Zeppelin were talking about squeezing their lemons and Things like that. Just ran down the leg, indeed. Yeah, I mean, it's far. You know, it's been around. Uh, Lucille likes to sure likes to ball. You know, that goes back to the fucking nineteen fifties, man. Yeah, yeah, so, you're right. It's always been there in rock and roll, but uh, I just kind of found it funny how uh, Kiss did it as as good as anybody else did, and and yeah. and, and always got kind of got away with it as well. And sticking his tongue out in your face and shaking his dong in your face and the sh- like it's just it, 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 at some point it just you had to be like it was just like overload for any like christian mom in like 1978 it was just like holy shit the fucking apocalypse is happening right, right. now there's no way like these kids are gonna they're gonna infiltrate my children they're you're in either, some ways you know. <laughs> like that you're either repulsed or or it was it made you laugh when you were yeah. Those are the two camps you had to be in, you know. And I think if you were, had a if you had a sense of humor, you were more uh, likely to fall into this kiss camp than you were somebody who was, you know, shocked or pissed off or like, you know, taking a religious stance on it. There's no way to conform to that, but right, uh, uh, which is pretty crazy. That's what rock and roll is built on: is offending the church, the parents, and your own parents, and everybody else, and teachers, and you know, that's that's the ground it's all built on anyway. Yep. So, and these guys definitely did that. Let's see yeah. if we can't get a little audio here. Wow. I know she only made you cry. <laughs> and walk the street beside her. Oh, oh when she walks, she'll pass you by. Very Gene Simmons heavy on that last part right there, yeah. but is you that, can hear. Is that another? Uh, is that another rehearsal recording? Or that's, is that that's the, that's the Daisy. Ah, the Daisy. Okay. The Daisy. So that is what um, I believe what us Kiss fans are going to call one of the, if not the earliest Kiss performance that was recorded. Yeah. So that was 1973, the Daisy, which I believe was Amityville. Amityville, you're correct. Yeah, and. Um, so that was the first one I, you know, when, when we're, we're, it's easy for us to talk about it now, but when we're talking about, let's say a fan who is listening to creatures of the night going, man, I wish I could listen to some of that real early shit. You, there's no way you could have gotten your hands on that bootleg. If you did, you had to know somebody who knew somebody like that kiss vision shit didn't mm-hmm. really come out until really much later than it should have, because the kiss vision stuff was just bootleg stuff that 
fans wanted to keep for themselves. They didn't want to. They didn't want it to get out. They certainly didn't want to get back to Kiss because it was a, well, a bigger deal. Kiss certainly didn't want it out either. You know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't blame them for it either. I mean, if you want to put out a product, you want to put your best foot forward every time, right? So, but yeah, that was a hardcore fan thing. Um, uh, as far as the first album goes, um, also an important, important matter is that that song, if you bring up the track that you're listening again, uh -huh. if we can, the, uh, what is that? Uh, Kiss in Time, dude. Oh yeah, the contest. Not even supposed to be on that record, and it wasn't on the first pressing. And uh, their manager. Why'd they add that. Who who was? Uh, There's actually a. What's his name at, at Casablanca? Um, Neil Bogart. Neil Bogart talked him into recording it. Promised it it would be a one-off single type, you know, promotional tool. So they said, okay, and then when the second pressings of the first album hit the market, that fucking song <laughs> was was on their record. They had nothing to do with it. It was wow. all, all Bogart doing mm -hmm. that. And uh, I think I would have strangled him if I was Kiss at the time, you know? Well, wasn't it directly attached to that Kiss in Time contest that they had in Florida? That's the whole reason for that they even recorded it. Yeah. Yeah. They're supposed to die and go away after that. and uh, Yeah, because that was a cover, right? Yeah. Of a, like a 50s, uh, old 50s song. Of course. Uh, the Jandales or something like that. I, I might be wow. wrong. I'm sure I might be wrong on that. But uh, anyway, he uh, yeah, almost completely double-crossed him and just threw it on, their, <laughs> on the next pressing of their album. It's been on there ever since. Well, I know that... Um... There was a lot of a lot of weird things when when you started getting into they started getting into the dynamic of of being with a uh, uh, with producers and other people other than themselves that had other ideas. I know that I know that that uh, the song um, what number was it? Yeah, love theme from Kiss was as most of us know now was originally recorded under the title Acrobat, and uh, Kerner and Wise, Richie Kerner and Kenny Wise, I think was their yep. names. Yes. Uh, they're the ones that basically told Kiss, you know, uh, in Europe, uh, love themes are really big right now. I don't know why I'm doing this with the cigar. <laughs> <It's not a laughs> really, Dude, you're probably I, <laughs> more accurate than you, than you think. <laughs> <laughs> right. but, uh, yeah, you see? <laughs> but they're huge over in Europe, you know? And so I think it was one of those things where they were like, you know, we're not acrobat. What the fuck does that even mean? Because even Gene said, for all intents and purposes, that song could have been called you know, licorice, and it wouldn't have made a difference. It's just some weird musical thing that Gene, half of it was Gene and half of it was Ace, and they just came together. It was like a weird riff that had a sort of a weird time change. And, uh, you know, uh, Kerner and Wise told them that love themes were huge, and so they wind up calling it Love Theme from Kiss. I never knew that. Um, yeah, it's as, crazy, as, huh? as far as who told them. <laughs> How's it, Bob? Love themes are big. And, and, Listen, you don't know about the big city, kid. Yeah. yeah I, I like, uh, on the other <laughs> podcast a while back, you, were the, you, know, you make a metal album, it's got to sound like this, see? <laughs> Apparently, that's one of the characters I have in my head from the oh, 70s. Yeah, an old, exactly. an old sweaty, greasy fucking guy with a cigar in his mouth, just making uh, just 99% uh, of your record royalties, and he's just... Yeah. just Banging hookers and stuff on your dime. Yeah, that's, that's what I think of. And he's perpetually talking you into really bad decisions <laughs> all, all along the way that only line his pocket. You know? <laughs> oh, man. Um, and, I, you know, I, I, I remember as we're going back, uh, um, st you know, sticking with the first album, I mean, I know Sean Delaney is also the guy who was very instrumental in when he was watching them in their, uh, in their loft uh, telling them because he, I think he caught Gene and Paul kind of doing this sway thing back and forth, and that's when he said to them, "Listen, you all have to do sort of this, this choreography, and I'm going to show y'all how to do it." <laughs> Which would have been golden to see Delaney out there with that fucking mustache, like, "Let me show you how to get this down," like, because he was definitely, you know, like we said, the style guy with them. But he got them to choreograph that uh, at least two or three of them, a yeah, cold gin, hundred thousand years, right? If I'm not mistaken, too. They were kind of like. At first, no, we don't want to do that. You know, it's kind of a choreography, you know. But uh, when he actually showed them what it looked like on on film, yeah, they were like, "You're right, man." You know, we they couldn't argue with it. You know, it. It worked. That's the shit that I want to see. 
And I because and I know uh, probably there's a lot of Kiss fans out there saying the same thing because we've already seen all that you can see. There's no really if you're a diehard Kiss fan, the stuff I'm showing you right now, you've probably seen in some way. Ad nauseum. But, but we do not. Ha we have never seen video footage of any of those loft rehearsals. And you know, I don't know if they said Delaney. Um, you know, Delaney might have because I think he passed away, right? Isn't Delaney passed away? I no, think he, yeah, he's been I gone. Think he well. took that with him. They don't really know where it is, but um, well, dude, I'll if you. Oh, go ahead, man. I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, I think Sean Delaney, if I'm not mistaken, actually did another version of uh, Too Many Mondays that Wicked Lesser recorded. Because uh, I think he, because he wanted, I think he was a musician too, but um, didn't Kiss get the studio time for the first record by banking it from being in Wicked Lester? Uh, as far as I know, that, yeah, you're kind of right there. The, the studio owed them some, some time. Yeah. Um, and I think it was either from Wicked Lester or even Jingles that Paul and Gene would go in and do jingles, local jingles for commercials and stuff like that. Um, and I believe they, they actually owed Kiss some hours, um, which they did at late at night when they could get more bang for their buck, I believe. But uh, going back to what you were talking about, about Delaney saving things like that. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I know the insides, what Delaney had or or kept or, or what even even what he was thinking but you have to imagine at that time that him nobody knew kiss was going to actually besides explode even make it you know yeah They're probably doing what most people were doing is re-recording over existing tape constantly you know like we did when we were kids and stuff yeah uh, that's day in day out stuff that they were working on so I would be shocked if, if any of that exists as far as the uh, filming and the rehearsals for, for performance and choreography and stuff like that. I'd be shocked if, if any of it exists, you know? Yeah, that sort of does suck. But, you know, and I, I think it was also sort of a slap together thing. They did it really quickly. I know that, um, you know, with um, – with their manager at the time, he basically said to him, look, give me, a, give me a little, give me a chance, give me a couple of weeks. And if I don't get you a record deal, you know, and so he was able to parlay that record deal because they had studio time already. So, you know, like it was sort of like a 50, 50 chance and like, let's hurry up and get this out. It was very much a demo. I think that album. Yeah. Um, and so that was definitely the raw, the raw kiss. Speaking of the demo, uh, which we were talking about backstage before, before, um, <laughs> they uh, did were able to talk an, an available Eddie Kramer into producing their demo, which I've heard that even from the members themselves that it it sounded superior to what the the debut album actually did when it came out. You know, yeah. So apparently, he's, Kramer's unavailable or or booked, you know, or whatever. I don't know what that was to the story about why he couldn't do that because he did, he could, and then he couldn't for some reason. Right. Or, or maybe uh, like, as we've said, uh, Bogart didn't want to spend the money on, on Eddie Kramer, which, cause he had a, a hell of a track record going already with Hendrix and uh, Alice Cooper and stuff like that. So that is crazy. Uh, anyway, regardless, uh, they, I've heard it sounds, they prefer it to the sound on the, uh, the production on the first album, but well, there's definitely there's definitely a progression, and uh, you know, along with progression, along with that theme, let's get into this. Hotter than hell. That was kind of an. Uh, that's a crazy album. I remember not hearing this album a lot, and I think I have the German version of the CD on up right here. Yes, I do, right there. Oh. With the with the uh, the different S's because they didn't really like that shit back then. <laughs> um, you will not, yeah. <laughs> you're not uh, support you the S's yet. Yeah. So here we are with Kerner and Wise again. Um, you know, uh, well Kerner and Wise, and and we're you know they they've got a, a lot of different a, a lot of different music on this album. I know I didn't. I don't think the second side was listened to anywhere near as much as the first side was for me. So I'm very well versed in the first five of these, especially Parasite, which is my all-time favorite Kiss song. Um, but, you know, all the way, wa I mean, watching you, yes, but Mainline was actually something I didn't hear a lot either. 
coming home in strange ways was just one of those deep cuts, man. But it was uh, it, the progress, the, the production was definitely different on this album. Well, I got to say, I'm just, I mean, I'm not, I'm not with you on this album as far as what you're talking about. But when I was really young, like you're talking about when I was maybe 10, I didn't listen to entire albums. You know, I picked a couple of songs, maybe like you said, the first side, and then you know, I would play something else. And then I'd be like, ooh, let's listen to those first five songs again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I didn't digest entire LPs at that uh at 10 years old. So I know exactly what you're, you're referring to. Uh, I didn't really digest this whole album till I, well, I was a lot older, but um, I love the hotter than hell. I like the way the production murkiness uh -huh. makes it feel at least uh, like a much heavier record than it, than it may be. If you cleaned up the production real, 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 you know, really clean like i'm not sure if it would come across as dark and heavy as it does because of the production you know a lot of people don't like the production on hotter than hell and uh fault it for that but i i think it it lends it a huge charm that's all its own it's uh no other a kiss album really sounds like that and because of that i think it like i said i think it, it actually lends something in the positive column for, for at least for me you know uh, yeah. it feels like you're listening to an early sabbath album or something like that and so i think it just feels it feels heavier you know and i, I love that 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 murky sound they've got on that between parasite and hotter than hell um those are two of the most wicked guitar intros for that band that because you know i, I obviously um, I, since I'm younger, you know, I'm starting to, I, I'm growing up into harder music a little bit at, at this point, you know, you know, the, the Metallicas and stuff are going to start rearing their head around 86 and things like that. And I'm already a kiss freak by that time, but it, it's just, it's just, I'm looking for something heavier when I'm going back as I'm getting older, I'm listening to current kiss, but I'm going back to at the same time. And I'm right. like, Oh shit, man. Like this fucking parasite song is so heavy, dude. And it's, it's matching up to some of the heavy metal I started listening to. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I think hotter than hell is a sick fucking riff, dude. Like it's a yeah. sick riff, man. <laughs> it's so good. And the drum, <laughs> like it's such a punch, dude. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yeah. Uh, I, when I was, I was, well, I'm not going to say I was, you know, not old enough to have been there from the beginnings, you know, like the first album and on, but, uh, I was already a kiss freak while it was still happening in the seventies. Yeah. Um, at that time, not only forget Metallica, my, Iron Maiden didn't even exist yet. Uh, when I'm listening, I'm sitting at home listening to Kiss, you know, Priest and Rainbow and UFO and some other, you know, obviously Black Sabbath, Zeppelin, Deep Purple. Yep. That all, you know, Alice Cooper, that all existed. But, um, you know, uh, on if you're, if you're mowing lawns for, for $8 a week, you're not going to have a lot of, you know, a lot of records sitting in your room anyways. Right. But, um I remember thinking the same thing even about like you were talking about comparing you know heavier stuff coming along the line to mm -hmm. you know to uh their live albums uh you know I was just comparing the, their own live albums compared to their their earlier studio output and uh even that was much heavier and more energetic you know yeah I hadn't even discovered priest yet Judas priest or anything. <laughs> Stuff yet. This is crazy, right? To think of that evolution. Yeah. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, let's give it a listen, huh? Do it to it. This is from Winterland 75. <laughs> Ha <laughs> 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 
<laughs> I heard somebody refer to uh, Ace's costume as the uh, the pizza slice costume. Oh, uh, the, the big pepperoni pizza thing that he's got. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I was like, that's genius. That makes so much sense. Like, that is great. Totally get that. With the polka dots on it or whatever. Yep. Yep. But, you know, there's just something about it, man. Obviously, Parasite, that, dan, 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 dan. And, and, you know, I saw Ace Freely a few years ago, two years in a row with my brother out here at a place called Oriental Theater, a very small place with his band. And, you know, like, it, that, that's what people are, they're waiting to hear him play that. You know what I mean? Like, it's such a riff that it's gone through time and stayed in people's heads. Like, you know, I think this actually, this shirt is from when you and I saw them. When we saw them, uh, I think it was one of the farewell tours in San Antonio. Like 2000, 2000. Yeah, 2000, I think is what it was. And he, Ace was doing like this medley of guitar riffs that he was going through. And then when they got to Parasite, I remember the crowd just blew up. And I'm like, that's that's how hard that riff has stuck. And it, it's, a, it's a weird song. I don't really, I mean, the lyrical content is kind of, I don't know, stupid, I guess. But I, like, yeah. it doesn't really mean anything. As it far doesn't as I, matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know. Like I said before, if you have if you have studs on your wristband, you're right. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. And at that point, that winter lane was 75. They had obviously gone on tours by that point. They took Rush for with them for Rush's very first tour. Uh, you know, obviously some other bands, you know, Uriah. There's a lot of bands that they were playing with that were uh that were just like they probably didn't want to open up for them, but then they realized they did, you know, like it's and and I remember him I remember Paul talking about Bob Seeger in southern states like florida that they would hear the crowd going absolutely wild for bob seeger you know and you know all in some of these other bands in these southern states and and that would make them go shit now we've really got to go out there and you know what i mean like they warmed it up but they warmed up a southern state we got to go out there and fucking win these guys over like jacksonville florida or something yeah. in 1974 like who <laughs> you're talking about kiss themselves you mean yes yeah, dude. They uh, and plus, they're kind of up against it from early on, looking the way they did. Uh, yeah, I heard a lot of those southern audiences didn't take to them right off the bat. You know, they had to literally come on and put that boot up the ass for <laughs> as hard as they could, basically. The same old cliche: is it woman? Is it man? Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, there's some great songs on Hotter Than Hell as well, dude. Uh, again, I. They may have had some of those in the in the pipeline from the you know from around the first album, the time of the first album. I'm not sure. Yeah, because this is two years difference, right? They put two albums out basically in a year span, right? Well, yeah, that's the thing about Kiss, man. I'm gonna go on a little tirade here on Good. the haters and trolls that have always um, and it's not, and it even goes back pre-internet. Uh, People that you know put Kiss, they like to put Kiss, Kiss down. Kiss is trash. Kiss aren't talented. Their their music's crap. Well, Ace, Fr I mean, uh, Alice Cooper said something once when he said, uh, in a direct quote, "You can have all the explosions and makeup and tricks and effects and gimmicks that you want, but if you don't have the tunes, it doesn't matter. It's not going to stick long term. You know, you're not yeah. going to have long term success." So there's obviously Kiss had the tunes. Um, there's something to be said for that you know, a lot. You know, uh, Gene and Paul were good singers, and uh, they knew what what to do. They, like I said, they were doing jingles for dog food and furniture sales and stuff in the studio. They could, El Poo. <laughs> <laughs> they sang really well together. Yes. Uh, it would sometime in the same songs uh, take a, you know, individual verses and choruses and together do it together. And yes, their blueprint and their some of their idols were the Beatles, uh, which is you know, McCartney and Lennon did that really well. The the, the dual vocal thing. Yes. And if you uh, outside of a course outside of rock bands, when you're going into soul and Motown and and things like that. Um, of course, there's there's great vocalists that work together like that. But uh, hard pressed to tell me, show me another rock and roll band besides the Beatles and Kiss. I'm sure there's you know there's some out there. Okay, the Beach Boys. You know they had a great vocal you know 
uh, collaboration all the time or a Simon and Garfunkel. Those aren't really rock bands. Uh, show me a rock band that had that Gene and Paul McCartney kind of Lennon vocal thing going on. Uh, I really, there aren't really that many at all to come to that spring to mind. With that being said, no, I'm not comparing Kiss as songwriters to the Beatles. What, what, <laughs> I, I certainly didn't think that's what you're doing, but yeah, yeah, for the audience, we might need to say but, that. As far as uh, the two, you know, sing vocalists in the band uh, that that worked that well together, um, Zeppelin had Robert Plant. There was no backup vocals in that band, even in the great Judas Priest, Sis Rob Halford, Black Sabbath, Ozzy, uh, name whoever you want. You know, uh, I will say one band. Um, I think I think Rock and Michael, Roll. Michael Anthony. Definitely added to date whatever David Lee Roth was doing, uh, but I don't think it's like magical what you're saying. I but I do think maybe uh, maybe Anthony was there in more of a uh, a help a helpful situation. <laughs> he was Dave that, that, uh, it, right. That's just, that's, yes. Well, he was all you know. He was great, but it, he was doing backup vocals. Yeah. Well, he wasn't doing verses. Yeah, and, he didn't have a song. He didn't have any, every other song or anything like that. Yeah, you're cool. right. Name somebody like Gene and Paul besides McCartney, McCartney and Lennon. Uh, That's true, man, who have like hits Mick for Jagger. multiple singers. Mick Jagger was, so, you know, he's the guy, you know, uh, Alice wow. Cooper, you know, Deep Purple. None of them had this kind of symbiotic Lennon and McCartney thing going on. So that's one thing I'd like to point out about, about why Kiss isn't trash. <laughs> because they had a couple of good singers in the band, and that really elevated them. Uh, they wrote some good songs too. They didn't write. Who writes all good songs? If there's any album you listen to by any artist. There's uh, you know, there's some that are okay, and there's some that are great. And uh, right. uh, as far as anybody that you know, they get a lot of hate. But uh, I challenge anybody. Hey, if you think you're, you're so cool, write a song better than Love Gun. You know, or write a song better than I Stole Your Love. Oh, I mean, they're not the greatest. I'm not preaching here because they're the greatest songs ever written. Dude, those are two great songs. They're pretty damn good songs, dude. And uh, I think Kiss, aside from the music too, Rush, for example, you, you mentioned that they, they toured very early on. In fact, yeah. the beginnings of Rush, they supported Kiss. And of course, Rush are at a higher level. They're technicians as musicians, right, than Kiss are. Yeah. Uh, Anybody be a fool not to admit that. However, they, uh, if anybody's seen, uh, what is it, Beyond the Lighted Stage? Mm -hmm. About Rush? Yeah. They, they actually uh, pro give props and put Kiss on the pedestal for, for sure, showing them how to work hard because Kiss was working harder than any other band at that time. And if you imagine not just working harder than all the other bands to give you your money's worth, but they were having to go in two hours pre-show before working harder than anybody else and apply all that makeup and costume. Yeah. Uh, that just takes it on a whole different, almost a mind blowing level. Not to mention the fact that they're releasing two albums every year in the seventies on analog tape, which is now it, it, most bands struggle to put out a, an album every one to two years. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but it's a digital age now. I can, you can record an album in your bedroom, for God's sakes, if you do. Yeah. Kiss was putting out an album about every nine to ten months from 73 to, what, 80? And touring every single cycle until around 80. So uh, that's just... In addition to, hey, these guys work really hard and have to put all <laughs> stuff on and write songs and record two albums a fucking year. So if you're, you know, whatever you want to say about Kiss is trash, you go say it somewhere else. I'm not fucking interested in hearing it, you know. Yeah, so we've got 20 songs that were written. Well, that's not, we don't have to count Kiss in time in there. Uh, but we got 20 songs, give or take a couple, uh, that were written. In, in the pretty much the same time frame, they're copywritten. Both 1974 is what this says, yeah. and so is this 1974, obviously. So, the, I, I I have never put out one hit song. Um, 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Like <laughs> <laughs> you and you're in the yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like you're you're right. Well, you can speak out, more I, so you I put out songs. I wouldn't call it well well, okay, look, there was no hits off those two kiss albums either. You know, none of them yeah. had, none of them had an airplay. But, and that, but that goes back to what you're saying too, because with Rush, yeah, they were better musicians, but the, but a concert, they're not selling you their album at a concert; they're selling you the concert experience at a concert. So, exactly. Kiss was better than everybody at the time, no matter how fucking good that band was. Kiss was the live concert, so yeah, you might beat them in, you know, you know, Dress wow. to Kill versus, you know, Fly by Night or something like that. Like you might get that battle won, but in the concert realm, you're probably not going to beat them. That's just not how that goes. I don't think anybody was at the time, and they in fact yeah. they were kicked off tours left and right as support acts. Because oh man, the shit between them and Aerosmith. I <laughs> didn't want to follow them anymore. Yeah, that goes on and on for like, Pop Seeger and everybody, man. At the back in the day, you know. So for a band that allegedly sucks so hard. Damn, nobody wanted to follow them, huh? You know, right? And uh, oh, it's the big, it's the bombs and explosions and the boots. Well, you know, it sure lasted a long time just to be bombs and boots, you know. And then Errol Smith's road manager got locked in a in a fucking in a drum case uh, for trying to uh, to. I think they tried to either cut them off early or or stop their to not maybe you had their pyro or something like that. They didn't want Kiss to put their pyro up. Yeah, that was uh, that was yeah, a. Man. Road crew did that, right? Yep. That was some crazy shit, man. Well, let's look at some of these picks from back then, dude. Look at that shit, dude. I mean, and, and I love that original Ace Face, man. That uh, that the big giant, like it was almost too big. Yeah. Look at that pick, man. Look at Ace. Hey, hey, listen, guys, I'm feeling pretty good right now. Go ahead and take that picture. Need another bottle of champagne. <laughs> That's these boots are hitting my feet. I'm only gonna wear one. Is that a disco ball or just some weird object? It's a, I think it's just a mirror. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it, it, this is this is the image. These are the images that that lured me into this band. It, it almost was like unless they were playing pop crap music like bubblegum disco shit, no matter what, I was gonna love this band because of Gene Simmons. Look at that, dude. That's that's the lean years, and they were they were uh, hungry and and. Yeah, dude, getting after it, man. And all of us were like three years old at that time. <laughs> yeah, dude. Give them some props, too. I mean, hey, they were in the game pretty damn early, man. You know? What do you think about that Peter Chris makeup on the first uh, album? It, it drives me insane. It, 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 it's, it, it, it reminds me very it, – it's very Kabuki-like. Uh, it's very uh, – uh, like Japanese, like samurai kind of thing. I don't know what I'm going with, and uh, and the Japanese part is not what drives me insane. What drives me insane is the fact that I saw it much later, already evolved, <laughs> and then had to go back at the first album, and be like, "What the f happened?" And then I, as I was older, I figured out the story about the the guy. I think I could live with it if the actual whiskers were right and the, the red that red thing under his mouth was gone. You know. Because even this is is a very early version of all of that. You know, the eyes stayed the same, but the whisker changed a little bit and going down and instead of out and straight up. Cool look, though. I love that, man. Finn Costello, man, took some great pictures. Oh fuck yeah! I was always obsessed with Gene's bases too. Um, what a strange choice. Well, I guess not. It kind of fit his personality, but those Gibson bases back then. Um. Why was that a strange choice? Let me know. I'm I'm part of your rhythm section, but I'm the drummer portion. So why, <laughs> no, why is that strange? I just not a lot of people were used. I mean, what at that time? Well, for the last uh, probably uh, twenty years before that, and up to that, Fender Fender basses are, are king, man. You know, most most hits and albums where there's always a, there's a Fender Precision on it or a Fender Jazz, but let's face it, they. They wouldn't have looked so cool on Gene with all that get up as those black Gibson grabbers did. I think that's what it is. I think that's exactly what it is, dude. I think it was like, yeah, it's almost like, uh, you know, if maybe he didn't care about what they looked like, it's possible these albums would sound much different. That's true, too, man. They had a unique sound to them. You know, they didn't he, if, at all. I can't imagine that they were very, they were great, they, but they had what they had. And maybe the studio did what they did to make it feel better or sound better to us. But Could I be. mean, they, so what's sound, the, they sound good in the studio, though. I mean, I always thought they, they sounded pretty solid, pretty thick, you know. 
Oh, look at that, dude. That's such a great action pose. What, you know, and how about this? You know, uh, aren't Fender strats all the rage at this time? What's up with the Les Paul? How, I mean, it, well, that's kind of another thing, right? Yeah, kind of, sort of. But I mean, it was it was in heavy use. Look at Jimmy Page was using them. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, Leslie West and, and you know, the, the Gibson Les Pauls and, and that they were using. Actually, Paul used much weirder guitars than than ace ever did you know yeah you're right actually because i didn't i think i saw I think he, he had a v at right or was an ace did ace have a v i forgot paul did paul <clears> had <throat> explorers v's uh man uh all, he even had some weird uh, other earlier kind of gibson uh i can't remember the models that they're that they are <laughs> excuse me oh uh, you know what i love that um the photo shoot oh, the, that, the, the, the orgy that shirt he wore there Oh yeah, it's that's again. It's like I think it's Japanese Japanese samurai kind of like he like never, like. He never wore it again. No, I think it wasn't his. I think it was. It was all uh, alone. Yeah, or like what do they call that when the uh, uh, the the studio or whatever uh, lo loans you the clothes? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I Damn! Look at that. It's like some fucking high school auditorium. Oh yeah! Look how ugly the curtains are, dude. Uh that fucking kit that Peter is playing is way too big for him. <laughs> Look at the bass drum. Look how big it is. Dude. Oh, it's such a beautiful kit, though. Um, again, the same. Uh, oh, that's great, right there, dude. Pizza slice. Yeah, pizza slice. I like how Gene's the hole in his thing is always off, off kind of to the right. Yeah. <laughs> Get that one nipple. <laughs> Look at Paul drunk, dude. Yeah, and locked in the car by Gene eventually. Yeah, and this guy didn't help. Well, also in that that photo session, uh, which is legend, uh, Ace's face was fucked up from a car accident. Yes, you are yeah. correct, sir. Everything is uh, superimposed on the cover, on the one side of his face. That they only did the makeup for half his face on that on that cover shoot. Yeah, I don't know that why that wasn't. Uh... Oh, it wasn't that on what that wasn't on there, but here it is. I'll get it up real quick now. Nah. Um, there we go. You are well, you can even see the stitches in his yep. uh, forehead right there. He ace really loved fucking crashing cars, man. <laughs> Apparently, well, you know what? It doesn't really matter. I'm just gonna get a new one anyway, you know. <laughs> he was a crazy bastard, dude. God uh, love him. He drove Gene and Paul up the wall, though, you know. Yeah, I guarantee it. They certainly wouldn't drive with them. That's for sure, man. Would you? Why? Well, no. I'm like, I'd be an adventure, I guess. Even people who drove his car with him in it got in car crashes, right? There wasn't there at least one or two times where someone where Ace was just on the fucking front seat with him, and they're bam, they slammed into a car. Yeah, dude. Uh, oh. uh, it's awful. Like, he's not a good driver. That's for sure. Better guitar player. He really liked drugs and didn't care. Uh, really liked alcohol a lot too. He liked alcohol a lot, which was usually the catalyst. Definitely, um, I'm digging your uh, your 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 photos, man, and your your graphics, buddy. Really, no, I appreciate it, man. Yeah, we're getting we're we're in we're getting into that. I had to save a couple of them for this right here because uh, I guess we can just jump right into it. Dressed to kill. For me, Dressed to Kill is uh, the Lost Kiss album. I don't know that I I don't know that we owned it, hmm. or if we did, I just didn't see a lot. I, I, I don't know what the case. Something it was just a, there was a lack of exposure to me to this album for some reason. Well, that happened. Uh, dude, that even happened to me as well when I was younger, dude. Uh, is there any? Have you? Has it remained that way for you, or did you eventually get into it, or you know, go back and check it out? It remained that way because if I'm being honest, the songs I pull out of here, Rock Bottom for sure, even though they needed to cut that fucking intro in a half, um, mm -hmm. the Rock Bottom, She, and um, well, I don't know, Rock and Roll All Night really. I, I think maybe Come On and Love Me Too is a good one for me. But uh, in terms of everything else, Ladies in Waiting, I didn't hear a lot. Love Her All I Can, I didn't love. But I think of Alive when I think of those songs. I do not think of Dress to Kill. Well, yeah, it's a great point. Yeah, I have to disagree with you on at least one thing, though. I think that intro on uh, the beginning of Rock Bottom, uh huh, 
is probably the most beautiful piece of music Kiss ever wrote, in my opinion. That's just me, you know. And I know Ace wrote it, I think, or Ace with Paul. But uh, uh, well, I want to say, I guess I don't know who they would argue about who wrote it. Who I wonder who who got the credit for that. But uh, I, there's no way that that there's no I don't know. I guess it could have been a Paul thing because it's you know it's I think just, it's simplistic. Him. I think Ace helped him because it sounds a lot like Fractured Mirror to me. Also, okay, uh, but they did borrow a lot of sounds. I guess I look at Wikipedia or whatever, but uh, I think that's a gorgeous piece of music, man. And it's 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 really unkiss like and way ahead of its time. I think you know, and uh, I, I get how a lot of people, and maybe even including you, say it's so. Oh, it goes on too long. It's too long. It was a little long, but I love it. I love it. Yeah. I learned how to play it on guitar. I love it so much. Nice, dude. I think it's a weird coupling with the song <laughs> Rock Bottom. You know, <laughs> it starts off, but I think a lot of this stuff starts off kind of. There's, you know, there's a lot of songs, I guess, with them that kind of maybe start off happy, but thematically, they're not really the happiest songs. If I had to guess, I would just say it's a great piece and they were looking to throw it on something, you know. Uh, it, that could literally start be on the beginning of any any kiss song you know because uh rock bottom is like i said is just a straight ahead it has nothing to do with that that intro. yeah yeah it is sort of a freestyle i think maybe it was just like hey, check yeah. out this riff i came up with and then they put it in there like we got to put it in there because it's cool but now i can understand like 11 year old bob going that, that that's fucking boring you know uh, why, why they should have skipped that or whatever I, I get that you know as i got older though I, it's just a beautiful piece that i think um in addition to that, uh, John, Come On and Love Me is a great, just such a great Kiss song, dude. It's, uh, it is. It's so good. I think it's probably my favorite thing on the record. Paul wrote it, right? Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense, uh, man. He's actually said since then that he probably couldn't write a song like that now. And it just poured out of him at the time. Well, I love She also. And, uh, but that he, riff is this good, dude. It's, it's you yeah. know, because we know that they're very rock and roll, but there's something that happens with Kiss when they start getting into sort of this deep blues, like dark blues zone that like I think a lot of us like. And there's a couple songs that definitely fall in that category. But th whenever they change it up from something that's not normally Kiss is when I think as a fan, we're like, fuck, this is why we like them. Because, yeah, they only play this music, but why is everything different all the time? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't make any sense. They don't no, always play the same shit. That's a really good point. Some were like dark and heavy and some were just yeah. like rock and roll, straight up rock and rollers. And uh, and I like to tell, maybe it may not have even been the right oh. idea uh, at the time, but going back to the debut album, having the piano in uh, uh, Nothing to Lose. You know, they, oh, they, snuck a, they snuck a piano into about three of some tracks of ours. If we, we know that, but yeah, there, there's something about it that adds an, an ambiance sort of to some of the music. It definitely on destroyer. They used it too, but um, yeah, I found it. I found it pretty cool. There was, whenever I did hear it too, I never felt like, Oh, that sounds whack. It's almost like, Oh, that sort of needed that. Cause there's, when, yeah. you, when you take that out, I think it doesn't really, there's, there's a reason why we add things like that, that are sort of out of character in songs is because, they they add a dynamic to it in a in a in a blank spot of it or or a shallow part of a song. I think you're right too about uh you know being heavy here straight straight ahead high energy over here. They had a much wider palette than people really want to give them credit for. Also, you know, in, in terms of style, theoretically yeah. there were four songwriters in that band. Yeah, which is astounding, really. You know, when you think about it. Yeah. I mean, how much stuff came from Ace trying to get a song out, but they didn't take his lyrics. They just took his riff or they just took like uh, something he put together and they made it into a song as opposed to his lyrics. Or and singing his songs for him because he, uh, he didn't, <laughs> was too gun shy to, to sing, which who can blame him, you know? Uh, yeah, well, he did. He definitely taught me one thing. You got to be attacked and you won't know what it is. You had to do it, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I love I love his rapping, dude. His his just his just like New York style rapping. That guy he needs to put out a hip hop album because it would fucking sell. I'd buy it in a heartbeat, but that reminds his you delivery of, was different. New York Groove is great too. I always love that song. Um oh, and this is the uh speaking of dress to kill, 
they they dumped the the white Kerner and Wise team. Uh huh. So I'm not going to dig it. I'm not going to you know uh, dump on them or trash them. I think those first two albums sound. They may not have been what Kiss wanted, but they sound pretty good to my ears. And let's face it, Kiss also didn't really get what they wanted on on Dress to Kill either. Right. According to them, they and. and uh, Kerner and Wise weren't involved in that production at all. Uh, in fact, it was uh, what's his name uh, again? Uh, Bogart. Bogart. And he didn't. And that's really weird. That's very weird. When I just saw the production credits right here on the bottom, produced by Neil Bogart and Kiss. And yep. Kiss had their own production in this one as well, because I think they were probably at this point like, let's try it where where the band is doing it. You know, we're having more input than a couple people. You're right. Uh, I think an evolution. Kiss really produced the album, and uh, Bogart paid for the studio time. So that's, that's what I'm saying. He got first credit because he put the wallet. Yeah, he's a producer, you know. But uh, he, I don't think Neil Bogart from Casablanca was not the guy at the fucking mixing board. I guarantee no, it, dude. He was. Not he all. was not there. He not was a tweaking all. knobs, dude. Um, I think that uh, it's a lot different in production from Hotter Than Hell, but not. It's not miles away from it either it's still no. it's a lot like the debut album in spots uh production wise i think they probably had a safety net there was something they were doing that was safe that they stayed with and they didn't maybe branch out too far from it because because it was kiss's probably first foray into actually having a lot to say with what was going on in the production of this album you're right and on the other hand too uh, i don't think they really knew how to get the sound they were after um, so they were on one hand, they were playing it safe and, and, you know, they were following that, that formula that they had started from the debut in Hotter Than Hell. But I also think they were grasping at straws. How the hell do we sound like a Sabbath or a, uh, you know, heartbreaker from Led Zeppelin? You know, how do you get that, that extra oomph? I don't think they knew how to do it yet or what they were looking for particularly, uh, without going live basically. And we got, you know, we got rock and roll all night out of it, out of Dress to Kill, which, you know, two and a half minutes, roughly a little bit more. Uh, it's crazy, but, it, you know, it, it, it's crazy how big it became, if I'm being honest, because really there's a lot of songs uh, and throughout their catalog up to that point that are just as anthemic, I think, and just as big and uh, that, that you could have, you know, ended a show with because, you know, I guess we're, we're nerding out here, but at some point they started them, they started it with uh, Detroit Rock City, right? And then they, I think during a live too, they went to Make in Love to Are start off their about, shows. They come out for anthems? They're set lists. Oh, well. Because their openings would change, but it would almost, almost and undoubtedly end with Rock and Roll All Night after this album. True, until it ended with uh, Shout It Out Loud. However. Uh, that's just for the uh, the live album, I mean, the second live album. Who's to say? I mean, were they still doing rock and roll all night at the end of concerts after? You know, because I mean, their live stuff was a lot different from uh, from the live albums. I mean, as far as their set list goes, you know. Yeah, that's true, man. And, so and I on, I, on the Love Gun tour, they were playing Kiss Alive too. You know, they were sticking other stuff in there as well, older stuff probably. Yeah. And newer stuff that's not on Kiss Light too. So, who's to say? But it's definitely a the first anthemic song, probably. Which as is big. It could have. It could. Yeah. I'm just saying that there's. It's it's just crazy how it becomes what it becomes. And I guess maybe if they didn't close out so many shows with it and get everybody on board with it, then it wouldn't have become what it became. If it was just something in the middle, and maybe. I don't know. Doctor Love was what they closed out the show, which definitely would fit too in Gene's ego. <laughs> but you're right. What if it wasn't on a live? Would it have been a hit? No, probably not. It wasn't it wasn't a hit as it were on on the studio album before that on Just to Kill. So that didn't take mm. off them at all until the live version. And I think if they uh, <clears throat> excuse me, if they had a button that they could push to add more crowd noise, they definitely did it during Rock and Roll All Night. Absolutely, one hundred percent. That button was hit. That mm -hmm. on, I think they did that on the whole album. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, because when I listen to it now, it's a little fucking much. Just a little much. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way they're going the whole concert. They're not yelling. <laughs> well, Kramer took the uh, the crowd noise from a Super Bowl and used that, dude, on 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 a live. That's beautiful. That is pretty wild, man. It's weird, wild stuff. You know what? Let's just jump into it, man. Kiss Alive. And again, mentally, I lump this in with a live two, uh, as as because I think I heard a live two first. Yes, I did. And then I went back to a live and listened to that and was like, dude, these fucking this band's awesome. I, I can't believe how many songs they're giving me in two records, you know, <laughs> and then you know, add into all this other shit. And and that's when I obviously started going back, and they were part that was part of the moving back thing, but Alive 2 is my my favorite, was my favorite, probably still is my favorite live album of theirs. But my brother always sold me on this and said, look, if you live if you love Alive 2, great, but you need to give this album its respect to because without this album, Alive 2 doesn't happen. And the things that you hear that happen on Alive 2 are because of what they did with Alive 1, um, which I assumed as a kid was 100% live, recorded in front of a studio audience. Record and go and, and and pressed on wax and given to me and my little hands were listening to it. Here's what happens at a at a Kiss concert, right? Is yeah. what, what you think when you're 11 years old. Uh, I agree with you on one thing, dude. Uh, it depends on your your uh, perspective and age. Because I owned, uh, I bought Kiss Alive two first, so it, it was more special in a lot of ways to me than than uh, Alive was. Even though, yeah. you know. The whole world's gonna argue with us uh, that Alive is the better album, and it probably it is. It is the better album. You know, all these years later, it's uh, probably almost no contest. Uh, the older I get, I realize that, you know, and, and give the Alive the props it deserves. Uh, but uh, Live Two is what hit me over the head. And there's no there's no change in that. <laughs> and the studio side to that album is was life changing for me. All American Man yeah. was like you know is one of my favorite songs for sure. Um, you know, larger than life, dude. It's just you know I don't know. The only weak link I I, I think and I, as a ten year old I didn't know any better, but uh, I think Rocking in the USA is a little a little bit weak, you know. Rock it and roll it, rock it and roll it. It is a no, bit, it's, still it, it's too much. It's a fun song, but uh, it, I don't think it stands up as well. But yeah, getting let's get back to Alive, where, we, where we're supposed to be. <laughs> um, so Alive was the first time I got to hear Parasite live, obviously. And 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 and, and that and it just definitely felt like a, a, a much tougher version. But, oh. you know, Hotter Than Hell, this version of Hotter, Hotter Than Hell is going to be burned in my head for sure. Rock Bottom. It's just I don't know, man. What 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 are your favorite songs on this one? The versions that you love of of the studio songs. Well, to touch on what you were saying a minute ago, uh, this was my second Kiss release I bought. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also pretty special to me. You know, it's, it came again before I got to hear any of the studio output. Um, I think the way this fucking thing kicks off, Deuce, is incredible. Uh, on, on a live man, just right off the gate, dude. Just uh, it just hits you right between the eyes. Um, Parasite, like you said, a hundred thousand years, man. Really, all of it. You can't go wrong with any of it. Yeah, I think that uh, it's strong from start to finish. And little did we know that that's uh, the only remaining totally live thing throughout the album is the drums, right? Hate to rain. Correct. Right? But we also did not know that at age eleven or ten or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, they didn't. Uh, I think was it. Didn't Peter? Didn't Pete have a problem doing that, or did he not show up? I don't know. I would. I would imagine he probably just no. didn't wouldn't think it was cool. No, they just his performance was good and good enough to. Cause, I mean, there's no click track. I mean, there it may have been. <laughs> had to base the whole thing off something, and it was. Thank God, Peter turned in a pretty good performance, really good, <clears throat> and they. Well, they Doctored all around it, you know. Thank God that he did. Let's Good. see all. Let's see about that. 
He's on, man. He's focused. Yeah, dude. She walks by moonlight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'll read the door. No chance in starlight. We're going home. <laughs> That's that? such good footage, dude. All yeah. right, so when you listen to that, and I and since I can't play because it's a recorded album, and you listen to a live that this is this concert, Cobo Hall was obviously where they said portions of that album were taken from, and there is such a fucking massive difference between what we just saw and what made it onto a live, or actually what they added onto a live post production or post concert. Uh, and, and I don't think I I don't know when what how old I was when I noticed that, but I don't think it even mattered because I think at that point it, it was already like an addiction. Like I'm oh, already yeah. a kid's head, dude. It doesn't fucking matter. At that age, we didn't know any of that anyway. And right. I, you know, we talk about context, putting uh, what was going on during, you know, the beginnings of Kiss Mania. Uh, nobody knew any of that. Uh, that, went, that goes for all the bands, too. Uh, uh to quote a good friend of ours, and I'm glad they did it. I'm happy that they went in and fixed things. Uh, otherwise, you would have had what we just heard as a double album, and that would be for all time. <laughs> Which yeah, I'm not, because- I'm not slamming what we just heard, but it's definitely not the official release, is it? You know, that's a good- so there's a <clears throat> it's that studio magic, and and again. It's 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 part and parcel to Kiss. You're gonna get a rock band, and you're gonna get this, but you're gonna get some other bells and whistles that they want you to have, whether you want to have it or not. Right. And they are definitely part of the industry, the industry that was churning out hits and making a lot of money for a lot of people who are motivated to do a lot of things, and and it was just part of business and all that. It, it just it was the complete package with Kiss when it came to that. Sure. It was a, when you said bells and whistles. I'm not sure exactly if you're referring to this or not, but what other band, when you bought an album, stuffed a bunch of cool shit in it for you to give you not just what you got, but the whole bang for your buck was in- incredible from Kiss in the 70s. You get posters and tattoos and stickers and, and order forms and booklets. I mean, actual books would come in their fucking live albums that yeah, dude. ended up on my walls, obviously, but, uh, you know, if you think about how how you know how smart that was, because you know, let's say you were just somebody who was like, you know, let's just put this album out. And they're like, no, we want to put this cool pop gun in there too, and a and a and a, a, a color booklet of pictures, and they're like it's going to cost a lot of money. They're like, dude, you're going to get that money back. What, you know other, what, band, I mean? what other band? What other band gave you a tour fucking program? Basically, for that's what you were getting uh, when you bought a live album. I, I don't, I can't think of another band that did that. Ever. That's the truth, dude. You know, that's true. Or a po- giant poster to put on your wall. Okay, the other bands did that, but that the Kiss did that and so much more. You always you got. Know, it, but. I don't know how much they had to do right away with uh, going ahead and signing off on merchandising, but I think they learned very quickly that that's going to be a thing. That this is a thing. And yeah, I know at one point it got out of control, but man it didn't really matter because it, 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 I don't think there was anything I wouldn't have bought with their face on it. Cause I had most of it. That's the know? thing. Uh, I guess they realized you'd have to be blind not to really, I guess, but uh, their image and their makeup lent, lent itself to just mer- merchandising paradise, dude. So, I mean, they, them or someone in the, uh, in their, 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 you know, direct group realized that really early on. As soon as they could afford to do it, in other words, they probably had the idea to do it before they could literally afford to do it. But uh, goddamn, what a perfect band to do a merchandising onslaught like that, you know? Seriously, dude, I, I, I don't know. They it, they did it. They did it. It was, 
you know, it, I guess most people will have you believe that they were the only people that did it, but dude, there were just as many like Dukes of Hazard fucking lunchboxes and thermoses as you know, maybe not as many as Kiss, but they were in a market that it wasn't like it was just Kiss shit everywhere. No, it was Star Kiss Wars. shit among everybody else's shit. Yeah, just Star Wars and Jaws too. Said, well, Hollywood knew how to do that, right? In rock and roll, it wasn't so much of a, it was kind of a, a new thing when Kiss kind of started doing that, you know. It was definitely a new thing. Yeah, they did. They broke a lot of ground with a lot of stuff. And and when it came to slightly misleading the customer base for the benefit of the customer base as well as the uh, the company, uh, they definitely led. They led in that. That was their game, and it is up until this point right now. They still do shit that starting with life. yeah, starting with a live man. You you uh, you also bought the record for the stuff that you thought you knew you were probably getting in in, in addition. So it was always well worth the the money you spent on it, you know. Yeah, and then they had you know they had other things that were going out, uh, you know, um, uh, double platinum. You know, they they had a way they had a smart way of repackaging and recycling things that you have already purchased that you are still going to go out and purchase uh, yeah. because it's 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 brand loyalty, and yeah. I'd be goddamned if I wasn't loyal to that brand. You said it, man. That's the best way to you know. Some people drink only Coca Cola. Well. I was really loyal, like you were, to, to Kiss, dude. Back when I was uh, really young, but and uh, and that's shit lasts forever. It's like almost like your first uh, your first girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever, you know. It's the first one, bro. <laughs> first, first kiss, you know. The what, first kiss, dude. Yeah, and there's a lot of stuff involved in this band that is burnt into my head, man. Like, you know, they have so many different trademarks, but obviously, this is one of them. <laughs> like I, I know that that yell that oh yeah like it's just one of those weird things that I, I don't know and you know that I know because I would yell it all the time to you at fucking drifter shows for some yeah. weird reason yeah. and, and it was just one of my things that I love doing and you and I both love we love throwing gene gene isms into like regular societal situations that was a lot of fun like a life yeah like what would Gene say right here? Like get out of my way, bitch! You know, like it's just he was just such a sexist asshole. But yeah, we had a lot of fun with with uh, with his personality throughout the years for sure. And Family Jewels let us in on a lot of that. A highly entertaining uh, sexist asshole, I might add. But yeah, because what is your favorite uh, tracks on on the live? Uh, you know, I'm going to go right away and say Parasite. But if I have to move away from that, um. I think I really like this version of Hotter Than Hell mm. and Rock Bottom. Oh, yeah, dude. Uh, and those are heavy, obviously heavier riffs, and I, and I dig them a lot. But I also, I can't, I can't discount She either because that version just seems really dirty and ding, 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 ding. You know, it just seems super dirty. Obviously, it's, you know. Yeah, dirty, dirty content. But uh, it, it, there's, I do like the dirty, grindy side of Kiss. It was always something that attracted me. Cool. The the picture of Peter uh, that I showed you earlier holding the fucking knife, like mm -hmm. that's 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 the version and mentality of Kiss I will always think about when I think about Kiss. Yeah, um, I think there's not a bad, really a bad song on Alive, dude. Uh, well, okay, if I had to, you know, step away. Well, you from mentioned that. one. Well. Let me go rock and roll. Right, it's a classic Kiss song. Uh, it is. Is that on "Dress to Kill," dude? No. Hotter. Oh, oh it's on "Hotter Than Hell." Okay. I've never, you know, it's just a standard straight ahead four on the floor rock and roll song, right? Two fucking minutes, dude. Yeah, you get to a, get to your Burger King in time to get a food, get some food, and go home. I don't dislike it. It's kind of a cool toe tapper, you know. It's a it's a it's very straightforward rock and roll. Like it doesn't oh, deviate very far. Ace rips his solo rips in it. He though. does. Yes, he does. You're fucking right. It really does. So, I guess it was a probably a performance vehicle more for Ace really at the time. I I, I would imagine. You know, I love Ace so much, man. I uh, <laughs> I, I, I we always defend him, dude. You should have brought up that one picture where he's falling down on stage. <laughs> I just oh. remember that. <laughs> I wonder if I still have it, dude. Hold on. 
Hey, uh, that speaking of that, that dress to kill cover, we didn't we didn't discuss that at all. Um, that was yeah. uh, uh, that was O'Coin's doing in Bogart, maybe. Because that that suit Gene is wearing uh, belonged to O'Coin, right? Bill O'Coin. Yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah, it's, it's so ill fitting. He didn't, have, he didn't have one, is the the way the story goes. Uh, Ace so, looks superb, dude. Yeah, dude, Ace looks bitch. So does Peter, man. This uh, suave, debonair, so, so suave, dude. Um, Scary I, the young children. What I'm wondering is, is that O'Coin's idea to do that cover for, for Dress to Kill, you know? Or, or Bo, if Bogart had some say in that, or an idea, you know, for that, because uh, I don't think Kiss would come up with that on their own, given to their own, uh, left to their own, you know. This is a great reference book, Nothing to Lose, if nobody has read this yet. I think it has that answer in here. For some reason, I didn't recall it. There's yeah. also another really good book, these FAQ books, this Kiss Fact. This is a great book. You need to check it out. It's got a lot of alternative information. Uh, but I, yeah, I think either that or the early years. Oh, the early years, dude. As far as just photography, right? It's not a lot of information in there, is there? No, but Abbott's Abbott's got that. Yeah, it's the Abbott, and it's the it's the white dot on the eyeball that I was pointing out earlier that they put into every single. I, at one point, I thought it was just Gene, but then I showed you pictures of children with the fucking dots in their eyes. Like, weird. it's pretty weird. Uh, nobody shot them like him, huh? No, no, he just there was just something about it, man. Super cool. Um, yeah. Also, you also got all that. Uh, I don't know if your brother's versions a version of Alive had all that stuff in it at the time, but you got uh, the evolution of Kiss, I believe. Um, was that the book that came in Alive? I mean, Alive too. Oh, yeah. You want to know something crazy too? And I'm just remembering this right now. Bunch of sorry, good. sorry to cut you off. That's right. Uh, there's a very, very good reason why watching you a hundred thousand years and Black Diamond of this on this album are not burned into my head because i think we broke our version of alive and it cracked and the only thing that cracked was a piece big enough for those three songs to not be playable <laughs> so basically side two for me started with rock bottom let me give you a plot <laughs> in, 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 in my brain and and i'm telling you right now if i go home to miami and find oh. that lp it's the same version with the broken piece because i never got rid of it dude but you were still playing the unbroken portion of the album right that's What's that you were still playing the unbroken portion of the record well was no i couldn't because you couldn't it was broken and the, the, it would just hit the needle and pop off so was so it I, the whole second disc or the whole out the whole second out no, just the it was, the chip was just big enough to break through. Watching you, hundred thousand years in black diamond. So I can put the needle down on rock bottom, oh. and I can, get, I can start doing a full uh, a circle without getting without hitting a crack or anything. And then That's it would start from there. Like, yeah, you were still able to play part of that fucking out. Right? Yes, but only <laughs> rock bottom to let me go. <laughs> That's totally, what I would have done too, dude. Uh, so now what is you're, I gonna take? What am I, some fucking rich asshole? I can buy another fucking Kiss Alive yeah, album. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so now, for the rest of time, you 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 have your own mental running track order uh, for Kiss Alive, right? It's the That's damn awesome, truth. Dude. Another reason why that didn't get burned into my head. Those songs aren't burned in my head because it was part of that. Me me repeat repeatedly uh, repeatedly playing that album had nothing to do with those three songs because I couldn't play it. Dude, I had a friend when I was a kid that uh, was. Uh, this is really assholey, dude. I went to his <laughs> house. He had a brand new love gun, right? Uh huh. Which we're not talking about, but anyway, uh, this other kid from the neighborhood comes over, comes in his room, and and my 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 friend uh, hides his new love gun under a pillow, pushes the other guy onto it, onto his own album, right? Then starts yelling at his mom. Stevie broke my album. Stevie broke what? my album. And what did she say to you? He, what exactly? Well, what he knew she was going to say, well, I'll buy you another one. So he could have two of the cardboard pop guns and the fucking, you know, love gun. Basically. So he, he uh, did that on purpose in front of me. And I, I it was really sinister, dude. It's evil <laughs> genius, dude. I know. All right. I know. It's evil genius. Like you sat, you're sacrificing a very good album to get a free one. But the pieces that were in it won't get broken because they're made of paper. That's genius, dude. With that being said, though, he wasn't spending 
He, didn't, he wasn't mowing lawns to buy his records. Let's just put it that way. Okay. <laughs> Isn't that how it always goes, dude? Yeah. 100%, man. Like you said, I would never would have done something like that. But uh, it, Oh, my it, God. That's, that's asinine. It's really funny, though, when you, you, know, when you think about it. It's genius <laughs> on the same level. But as, the, uh, as it stands out, that disc one is still a very, our uh, disc one, side, uh, you know, the, the first two, the first record, side one and side two would be the case on this one. Uh, Deuce all the way to She is just, it's insane. It's insane, dude. Like, he, he, and I, even though I might have skipped Come On and Love Me a little bit more than anything else because I wanted to get to Parasite, that's really the problem. The yeah. problem with the Come On and Love Me was just before Parasite. So it, it, I, at that point, I wore out my welcome with it. I was just like, you probably haven't listened to that song a whole lot then because you rarely listen to, uh, well, you've got it on like double platinum and stuff like that. Though. Right. But, uh, yeah, they delivered it in other ways. Yeah, I hear you. As they uh, are good, good doing. But Eddie Kramer producing? Yep. So that's the first time since their demo that they got Kramer, they got to work with Kramer. I'll tell you one thing, though. This George Marino guy mastered all of them. Oh, okay. Well, he was probably mastering all the Zeppelin stuff and all the Sabbath Sterling stuff. Sound, New York City. Oh, so yeah. that's that. That was the place to get your album mastered in the 70s, dude. That's where they did all four of their albums. All four of the albums we just covered were, were that that Marino dude. That's a name I have not heard. And I guess maybe board masters and stuff like that don't necessarily get that kind of credit, like a, produ a producer or anything like that. But still, that's crazy. Yeah, it makes me want to go look at all the Zeppelin albums and, and stuff and see who. I guarantee you that guy was mastering probably 60% of everything at that time. Wow, man. I mean, I don't know how he did it, but he must have. Well, he probably had help, obviously. But uh, that was the one plant that they would everybody seemed to go to, at least in America. And I know he did some uh, British or you know British stuff as well, probably. Yeah. But uh, prolific, that, that guy, for mastering. Well, shit, dude. Uh, we we did. I was gonna say we kind of ran through that, but we haven't. We ran a, we ran pretty long here, but I don't give a damn. Like I said before, man, this is a discussion about the first three studio albums of Kiss and Kiss Alive. If you thought that was gonna be packaged in a twenty minute video, you're mistaken. Uh, we are two lifelong Kiss fans, and we just really wanted to talk about this. And I hope you guys enjoyed the discussion. Uh, Stoney, is there anything you wanted to say about these uh, four albums before we get out of here? I think that to the casual Kiss fan or casual rock listener, um, they're not the kind of record, well, aside from, from Alive, the first three studio albums, aren't the kind of albums that will change your world in 2021. Uh, however, if you spend time with them, like people used to in the good old days, uh, well, nobody does that anymore, really, but... Um, if you actually sit down and digest them and pass more than one play, I think you'll find a lot of things that you like on those three three albums, man, the first three. Of course, Alive is Alive, and there's a reason. Kiss was uh, floundering. Uh, they were on their last leg, dude, uh, as you know. And I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but Alive saved Kiss, saved the record company, Casablanca, and Bill O'Coin and everybody else around them, dude. Uh, it's insane what that one album did for so many people's lives, like and, and just life, income based. Yeah, and that goes. Who knows? Uh, I was talking probably hundreds of people that were about to be out of a job, you know, in 1975 when this. It's so was, crazy, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm on board 100, percent man. I think anybody who is uh, uh who digs any sort of nostalgia, uh, if you're a Kiss fan that became a Kiss fan later, obviously you've gone back and listened to it. But if you haven't gone back, uh, you know what are you waiting on? You know yeah, these some, guys. <laughs> some people don't don't follow the breadcrumbs uh all the way back, and I've never understood why. Uh, now we're it's a totally different time than it was in the 70s and 80s, but I could never resist the the trail of breadcrumbs leading back to a band I loved uh, or early work. You know, yeah. See how they got there and where they came from. and Yeah, like what happened to you? Who hurt you? <laughs> if you want to see all that. Yeah, and why do you sound the way you do now? Uh, I don't understand how people have zero curiosity, but 
you know, if it's if something is important to you, whether it's music or an actor or uh, your a car, you're going to find out about it. Uh, I think I think there is still this generation currently that is you know in the 18 to 25 zone still loves their music. Uh, do I think that they look back at music that came before their music as a whole? I don't know that their generation does that anymore. I think we might be the last generation that is considering the line of work or the body of work we get to look back on. I understand why, but at the same time, they still have the seventies, eighties, nineties, and all this that they could be nostalgic about that. I don't see it happening so much yeah, uh, other than t-shirts on Kardashians. You're right. I think, I think that's a thing that's gone. And um, by and large, I mean, yeah, there, there's probably some, there's a few kids or younger people out there that, that do do this. Yeah. It's a, uh, Few and far between, probably it's it's not definitely not the norm anymore. And when we were young, it, it really kind of was the norm, at least to a certain extent. You uh -huh. kind of you know want to know where, where your heroes developed and came from. You know, you know, and I guess I, I say this a lot, but it's like every gener every ten every decade, America goes through through this like learning phase where they learn what they what they were stupid about ten years ago, and that's why the '60s people were smarter than the '50s and. Or, or I wouldn't say smarter, but more aware. So awareness starts getting on. And, you know, and, and what I think is funny, you and I talk about it all the time. We are aware of all these things that have gone on in KISS. Up, even up until this point, we start knowing that there is a rift happening already in KISS. But we are still loyal to them to this yeah. day. We, we just spent an hour and 45 minutes talking about the first three albums <laughs> that started in 1970 fucking four and up to Alive, which was 75, right? Uh, hey, how many, how many bands years. put out uh, four albums in two and a half years? Dude? Or four of those albums in two and a half years, too. I know. Uh, made up of, of stuff. And I guess maybe Rush could be in that thing where you can, there's some bands that you can go back to their first three albums and be like, this is important shit. You need to hear it. This needs to be part of your set list. But it didn't always happen that way. When bands evolve, they wind up dropping deep cuts and, and not going back to them ever again. But Kiss was about nostalgia from day one. So it was, it was going to be a thing where if you didn't hear this one song live, if you just stuck around long enough, what their new iteration of their kiss would be, they might play that and you, they might play that song for you down the road. And they did and they do and they have, you know? Yeah. Uh, I think you probably, they probably had, I don't want to say every concert in history they've ever done, but uh, they played Strutter, which is on the first album, pretty damn uh, consistently. Yeah. Through to now, I mean, so that's a hell of a long time to keep songs in in your live set, and uh, not through a need of a lack of songs. Either, you know, that's the truth because they could have just seems like they could have just made up some new ones and it would have been good to go. But exactly, and they, well, they did always have new ones coming out, but uh, you always, you know, they're all good. I think, man. I mean, by and large, you know, there's there's stinkers here and there. Well, this is definitely uh, it was definitely a great conversation, especially getting to go back and relive some of the memories of uh, of sitting in front of a uh, a record player with with ear earphones as the big as the ones that I'm wearing right now, maybe bigger, and a big a big twirly cord attached to my record player, and, uh, experiencing what what would uh, what would catapult me into a life of love of music, where uh, you know I'm basically listening. I, I have. I, songs running in my head all the time because that's just the way it goes when you are what we are um so thanks to everybody who stuck it through the uh hour and almost two hours that we decided to talk about these albums but again you, we just covered four albums right now uh that's not really that that bad uh it, it took almost as long to talk about it as it did to play them i would imagine um well, well we're, we're gonna do uh go ahead well we probably would have gotten through it a lot faster had it not been for our constant um uh, nostalgic. <laughs> that is one hundred percent why I did this. Yeah, we're, we're we're as nostalgic about it as a lot of other kids. It's hard to talk about kids and not not be nostalgic. Is my point. You know. Yeah, and I'm gonna and I guarantee you right now, uh, this podcast will not be the first podcast to focus on the first three albums of Kiss and Kiss Alive. I guarantee you, there's nine hundred other ones. But you know, you came here to listen to what Bob and Stoney had to say about it, and we are just as much of the fan base as you are who, who actually stuck around to listen to what we had to say. So thank you to that going forward to next week though, we are actually starting to get into some of the stronger, hardier 
uh, records from Kiss. We'll be talking about Destroyer, Rock and Roll Over, Love Gun, and Kiss Alive Two. Um, that's the that's some starting to get into some of the 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 more of the good shit. If I'm being honest, it was already good shit up to this point, but it just started getting better at this time. And uh, continuation of the good shit. This since there was a catapult from the end of Alive. Uh, they were thrown into the living room of every single American and it started leaking into Japan and other countries. And this is really when the big evolution of KISS started happening. So thanks to everyone who came to hunt, to hang out with us right here on the Record Stash uh, Revisit. Uh, myself and Stoney, thank you for hanging out. Stoney, thank you for coming and hanging out, man. Uh, what time are we going to do it next week? I don't know, but we're going to we're going to revisit those uh, records in our stash next week and uh, we'll get into that. So. Again, thanks so much for everybody hanging out, Stony. Thank you, for Bob. Telling, dude. Thanks, thank, thank you for letting me come on and uh, blather on about another band I love. So, always, you know, count me in on on stuff like that. Uh, yeah, Kiss or any other band I love. Uh, who who doesn't like to talk about music anyway? Well, you're on the hook for next week sometime. So, <laughs> we'll talk about it then, man. Until until then, guys. Thanks so much for coming out and hanging out at the Casually Serious Podcast, and we will catch you next week. Oh, yeah. Wanna make believe?